Well, I was born in Kenya, East Africa, which was a very multi-religious society at the time. And I lived in a, a kind of compound. And in it, there were Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, and two or three, quite literally, Catholics. And it was basically the Indian community living together. And I guess it was just w growing up in that sort of environment where when they had their feast days, they came and gave us sweets, invited us to the fireworks for Diwali. And I grew up with this real sense that, you know, these were all sort of brothers and sisters and people of, of not the same faith, but that we were all in it together. And it only kind of hit me that this was not the case. In fact, when I went to study theology and my tutor, John Hicks, said to me, Gavin, what do you make of the Catholic teaching on uh, no salvation outside the church? And it was sort of like a brick bat. I thought, what? And um, that really did make me reflect. There are two periods of thought. Uh, the first period of thought, uh, when I was very, very influenced by Karl Rahner, and during that time, I think my th theological method was quite determined by my understanding of Rana, which meant that uh, as someone who was trying to do Catholic theology, one had to be faithful to the sources. But using, in some respects, his philosophical framework of theological anthropology to understand key questions. So I guess that was stage one. Stage two, which is, leads me into the present day, was increasingly unhappy with Rana's theological method, which depended so heavily on anthropology, uh, and an anthropology that was informed by German idealism. So I think I sort of slowly began to find in my criticism of Rana theologically my theology of religions wasn't comfortable anymore. And I guess it can be described as a move to the right, if you want to use those analogies. But from a sort of Ranarian position, it moved much more towards a position influenced by theologians like Hans von Balthasar, John Paul II, the present Pope, Cardinal Ratzinger, and various people uh, who were called the Nouveau Theologie. Uh, in, in sort of Vatican II Catholic terms. And the theological method can be described as a reliance on scripture, tradition, and the teachings of the church in an ad hoc manner. And I think it was a move away from, from the Rana systematization. I think I should also say that the one key influence in this move was reading Karl Barth. I did mm -hmm. a couple of summers immensely immersed in Barth. And I, you know, I seriously grappled with, gosh, this, this chap seemed to be getting to the truth more than a lot of Catholic thinkers. And uh, I kind of wondered about all that. And what made me be able to integrate Barth into my Catholic thinking was von Balthasar's book on Bart, which offers a wonderful critique of Bart and a wonderful appreciation of him. And when I read that, I thought, ah, oh, that's it. That's how he needs to be integrated. Um, so stage, those were the sort of theological masts. Well, uh, in my stage one, I was very solidly behind the typology and defined myself as an inclusivism and felt that it was the only route because uh, exclusivism seemed to limit God's grace and outreach and also seemed to entail a kind of uh, solution which seemed most unchristian, which was that millions of people would end up in the hellfires of perdition through no fault of their own, which seemed totally unacceptable. A bit of me felt, well, I couldn't be a Christian. If, if that was the truth, I would have to knowingly mm. reject it. Um, pluralism, on the other hand, the sort of Hickian position, was unacceptable because it seemed to sell out the whole of the bedrock of faith that uh, why one would be a Christian 
was totally negotiated away so as not to be offensive. So inclusivism seemed the only solution, stage one. So the threefold topology was great. Stage two, the threefold topology becomes a bit problematic. And I think at the moment I would say it's quite useful if you want to teach people about the discipline, but you need to shatter it. And the two main critiques about the topology would be that uh, what I would want to argue is that pluralism is a type of exclusivism. It's simply secular modernity interpretation of religion. And in, in a way, although John Hick thinks this is a sort of silly argument, I would simply say that he argues that only certain types of people can be saved based on his criterion of how the divine operates and certain people are excluded. And inclusivists also argue that so in a, in a funny sort of way, what I discovered and what I think now is that what we have are three types of exclusivism with different sorts of pressures and tensions, etc. And the problem with the terms pluralism, inclusivism, exclusivism is that the baddies are seen as exclusivist. The goodies often are seen as pluralists because they want to be nice to everyone. <laughs> Uh, and it has all these unnecessary sorts of pejorative implications. So I think for theology to kind of make a step beyond, it could break away from these paradigms and focus on the doctrinal questions at stake, which are basically Trinitarian and Christological and ecclesiological. And a bit of me thinks, and this is part of what my new book is about, is to say, why don't we just start talking about the criterion as doctrinal ones? and not have these terms, which are pretty elastic anyway. I mean, for example, um, all three categories can be universalist. So an exclusivist, like Karl Barth is often seen, is a universalist. So is Rana, so is Hick. So what's the point of putting them in these different boxes if for all three of them everyone's saved at the end anyway? Um, so what would be better is to have different criteria to make the distinction between different positions. In a way, my new book is actually looking at that very point. It's saying, look, we needn't have this tension. We can quite firmly say other religions are not salvific. They can't be because they don't teach the triune God. I mean, there's nothing, uh, salvation means that. Now, if they don't teach the triune God, they're not salvific, fine, but they are not necessarily all going to hell or into damnation because dot, dot, dot. And in, in the book I'm writing, um, I, I spend a very long period looking at Lindbeck's proposal uh, of um, a post-mortem uh, salvation opportunity given through the chance for people to receive Christ. Now I happen to actually disagree with Lindbeck's way of uh, expressing it and I develop an alternative which is related to Christ's descent into hell and preaching to the spirits in prison as one Peter has it, uh, which is the old doctrine of some sort of limbo of the fathers and I try and rehabilitate that teaching to show us how we can understand how the good and righteous non-Christian, who through no fault of their own has not rejected the gospel, may yet be saved. And in brackets, and it won't be through their own religion, it couldn't be because they're only saved through Christ. And secondly, they can only be saved through Christ explicitly, not implicitly as Rana has it. Because in one sense, if you were saved implicitly, you sort of uh, technically enjoying the vision of the Blessed Trinity in total bliss, but you don't know the Blessed <laughs> Trinity, <laughs> possible. So I, I'm, I'm uh, wanting to suggest in the new book that particular tension is quite solvable. <laughs>